everyone. I'm Devja. I'm a program manager with Google Earth Outreach. This is our new interview series on the map, where we invite members from our user community to share their stories of mapping for social impact. If you're watching us live and have any questions for Madhu, please click on the Ask a, button, uh, Ask a Question button to leave your question. I'm joining you today from the land of tigers and lions and a wide diversity of animal species. Um, and I also have here with me today a very special guest, Dr. M.D. Madhusudan, fondly known as Madhu, who is a wildlife conservationist, a longtime Earth Outreach trainer, and a Joe for Good community member. And now he works as an independent researcher. He can tell you so much about the wildlife of India, and there's always something to, new to learn every time you chat with him. Welcome, Madhu. We're so happy to have you here. Thank you. Um, Madhu, where are you joining us from today? And uh, can you tell us if this is also where you grew up? So thanks first for the very warm welcome. And it's lovely to be talking to you as a part of this new interview series. I'm joining you from Bangalore in southern India. But I did not grow up here. I grew up in Mysore, uh, a place as you may have noticed, I carry in my name. Uh, Mysore is a great place for a wildlife enthusiast to grow up in. It is a small, uh, quaint town and I was growing up, but it's now a city of about a million people and located some 120 kilometers or 75 miles southwest of Bangalore. I spent my school and my early years, uh, early college years in, in Mysore, and then I went away to do a master's degree, but I came back thereafter and uh, I've lived there now for almost 25 years, helping set up and run the Nature Conservation Foundation during this time. Maisa sounds like a beautiful place to grow up in, Madhu. Um, can you walk us through some memories from your childhood and uh, what were you like growing up? You know, I'd love to hear that. I think I was quite an ordinary kid. But then uh, I think Every child is born with an innate curiosity and wonder about life around us, about nature and about animals. Unfortunately, most kids end up being educated out of it, but I was luckier, I guess. Uh, my parents were both teachers and they were quick to spot my very keen interest in animals and in nature, and they went really out of their way to encourage it. So I grew up taking morning walks with my dad to a part of the neighborhood where people kept lots of domestic animals. They were cows, buffaloes, goat, sheep, chicken, turkeys. So I, I loved going and watching them and being among them. Occasionally we went and uh, we'd walk to see a friend of my dad and a neighbor. And he was a very skilled taxidermist to whom skins were being sent from all over India and even Africa for mounting. Uh, Indian loss had changed the year I was born and he was already beginning to go out of business, but he had a large workshop and in them, in that workshop, there were still life-size tigers, lions, deer, antelope, and so many other animals. And there were also these really grisly artifacts like footstools made from elephant legs and lamps held up by stuffed monkeys. So it was a place that both scared me and, and fascinated me. Uh, I also, I mean, I, I wasn't born in an apartment building that's a skyscraper. I had the privilege of a yard in our house. I could spend hours chasing butterflies and dragonflies, catching garden lizards, digging up beetle larvae and earthworms. And that was that was great fun. Also, Mysore had a, a, a large century old zoo. So on weekends, my dad put me on a tiny seat that he had put on his bicycle for me and off we went to the zoo. We spent entire mornings there. So I'd be entranced by elephants and chimps in particular, and I could spend hours watching them and had to be bodily hauled back home when it was time to go. My parents also plied me with a lot of books about animals. And so it was really no surprise that I've been interested in nature for as long as I can remember. Then during my school years, besides reading, I was privileged to have access to a pair of binoculars that my dad owned and I was I, I began watching birds. And I also continued to go to the zoo regularly, but now as a volunteer and I worked as a, a volunteer through my high school years. So uh, as I said, 
Uh, Mysore was and still is a fantastic place in which to grow up for anyone interested in wildlife. Within 50 miles of the city in three directions, there is there are some of the largest and best global populations of the Asian elephant and the tiger. So not only did I have the chance to visit these places, but as I finished school, I also had a fantastic opportunity to assist and learn from a few very remarkable people, filmmakers, naturalists, and even wildlife ecologists working in these forests. Wow, Madhu. Um, when you were talking about your childhood, I feel like I almost vicariously lived through it, um, the way that you were describing it. And it's really interesting how life takes us on certain paths and uh, how much our early experiences have a role to play in it. Um, and, you know, you mentioned that uh, one such experience for you was your time in the Padra Tiger Reserve and it um, you know, really defined the way that you look at wildlife. So can you tell us a little bit more about it? Yeah, I think that was quite a turning point for me. I was 15 and I was in class 11. I was on a long summer break and I had a chance to volunteer at two nature camps and there was a month's break in between. And I spent that whole month with a couple of youngsters like myself and we just wandered about the forest and that that experience was utterly life changing besides the the thrill of being in a real forest for the very first time and i was i was learning something every single moment uh, in in everything i saw or heard or smelled or otherwise experienced and also for the very first time i was i was uh, in a sense seeing animals where they were meant to be not in cages but but roaming free and that made me realize what a sad place the zoo was and it also made it uh, much harder for me to go back to a, a zoo and enjoy it. Uh, also, during the, that month in Bhadra, I was not seeing the, the pristine and the unpeopled wilderness I had imagined there would be. Everywhere there were uh, signs of people. I was seeing the imprint of humans. There were, there were roads and trails that were uh, in every corner of the of the forests, there were neat plantations of timber where I thought they would only be dense, impenetrable forests. And here and there, there were fires set by people um, that were burning across the park that summer. I went with uh, forest guards on night patrols where we sat waiting near trails, hoping that uh, we might intercept people who had gone poaching or were smuggling timber. So there were there were cattle roaming everywhere. And uh, there was an outbreak of foot and mouth disease that year, which was killing dozens of deer and gaur. Gaur are these are the largest wild cattle in the world. At the same time, I was also uh, seeing how farmers were struggling in the nearby village to uh, every day to save their crops from pigs and elephants. So in the span of that one month in ways I could not fully grasp, I had a chance to experience not just the thrill of walking in the forests and watching animals, but also uh, I, I glimpsed some of the difficulties and complexities involved in conserving wildlife on the ground. Um, very rightly said, uh, Madhu, you know, when one looks back and thinks of moments that uh, stand out for them, it's really these moments when you come face to face with conflict and distress that uh, get very vividly etched in our minds. Um, now, zooming out a little from um, the personal experiences uh, you shared to the latter picture, uh, Madhu, you've been a conservationist for what, more than 20 years now. Uh, what can you tell us about how the landscape of the field of wildlife conservation has changed in India? That's a hard question, a big one. I'll, uh, I'll especially to tackle briefly, but I'll try. Um, I think the biggest change that has taken place in wildlife conservation is how we perceive the challenge of conservation itself. Let me explain. So in 1972, the year I was born, India did something that it had never done before. It gave itself a new and comprehensive law to enable and support wildlife conservation. It's called the Wildlife Protection Act. But back then, there were relatively large numbers of poor people who obtained food 
fodder, fuel, fiber, and far more things from our forests and natural areas. And many of our laws that came about then sought to keep these pressures in check. So back then, when India was a developmental state striving to uh, reconcile its efforts to reduce the desperation of the deprived against the needs of conservation, it appeared that this was really its most formidable challenge. But then things didn't stay the same. Things changed. Global geopolitics changed. The Cold War ended. A globalized world that was completely bound in like ties of trade that became the norm. And by the 1990s, India had just walked into the embrace of free markets and neoliberalism. And since then, we've kept our engines of economic growth revving pretty much nonstop. And more than ever before, we are now feeding such growth by placing more and more of our natural areas in the hands of private corporations. Today, our natural areas and resources, our soils, our forests, our grasslands, rivers, lakes, oceans, they're all being harnessed relentlessly to drive this frenzied growth machine at scales and rates that are throwing an entire planet out of whack. And this is turning out to be a rather dangerous ride also because the laws and regulations that were meant to function as brakes on this hurtling growth machine, making our ride safer, have not been particularly effective at all. And this, to my mind, is the biggest challenge today. So at the same time, the manner in which we have achieved this very impressive economic growth has left millions of people on the margin. They've simply not tasted the fruits of this growth and are left well behind. So in their desperation, they have no option but to lean on our natural areas and resources to get by. At the same time, the appetites of those who have completely like gorged on the fruits of our economic growth, I mean, their appetite remains utterly insatiable and they too lean more and more heavily on nature and natural resources. So this relentless and intensive exploitation of nature and natural resources is not just hurting conservation today, but it threatens very marginal livelihoods of millions. And it makes our economic choices not just a challenge for conservation, but as much a challenge for our uh, ideals of uh, equity and fairness. Absolutely. You know, very rightly said, Madhu, I think it's um, not just a challenge for the environment. It becomes about social inclusion. It becomes about um, making sure that marginalized communities um, look at conservation as a part of their current living without, you know, really limiting their economic opportunities. We've heard so much from you, uh, Madhu, about your role as a conservationist, but you've also been um, the leader and co-founder of an organization that's done incredible work for conservation in India. At what point of time in your life did you decide to start the Nature Conservation Foundation and uh, what really inspired you? You know, in your quiet and thinking for yourself, I mean, you realize that life has been a series of many, in my case, very fortuitous accidents. I had no plans whatsoever of uh, uh, setting up an organization like NCF. I didn't even have plans of becoming a wildlife ecologist. I was just interested in the outdoors and wanted to watch animals, and that was that. But one thing led to another, and before I knew it, I was in the Wildlife Institute of India in 1993. For the first time in my life, I was among people who were just as mad as I about being outdoors and watching animals and, and were prepared to give up a lot for that chance. And uh, it, felt, uh, it felt like we had all come home, in a sense. So at that point, it was not high ideals that, that, that propelled us, but we were simply thinking, how can we work together? And personally, for me, it was clear by then that doing this would allow me to be among a group of extraordinary people from with from whom and with whom I was I was learning so much. I was drawing inspiration from them while also having lots of good fun. And to start an organization was one way in which we thought we could pursue these ideas, ideas that interested us, problems that we were motivated to understand or work in the places or on species that we were uh, crazy about. This, in a way, has remained the very bare motivation of NCF, to be a place that is a welcoming home to people who are curious about 
and concern for nature and to help them do the work they love to find meaning hopefully not just for themselves but you know also strive to give something back to the places and to the people from whom we ask and have taken so much so within a year of graduating without the faintest clue about what it took to run an organization and on a on a grand corpus of 2000 rupees cobbled together from our measly savings but with the full conviction that the journey was going to be entirely worthwhile we plunged right in we signed on a few papers and before we realized what we had done nature conservation foundation had come into being wow um such humble beginnings madhu and i know uh, today we're all so grateful that you decided to go through the decision of starting your own non-profit at such a young age um it's pretty impressive i'm sure that over the years there must have been so many moments when you've been proud of what you've accomplished through ncf and at ncf can you share some of those with us i don't know about pride but i do know that uh, very often i feel very grateful i feel i feel more grateful than i feel proud and uh grateful that we've been able to come this far it's now the start of our 25th year and when we started we did not think we would come this far so many of us have spent more than half our lives at ncf and this journey has been also made very special and rewarding by the chance to work so closely with so many talented creative and capable people by the immense amount of learning and unlearning we've done together and this has helped us you know question our deepest beliefs the ideas of conservation with which we began and not the ideas of conservation we carry with us today and to have had the chance to create an institution that offered not just a scrutiny and supervision in a sense but also the support uh where one felt safe questioning oneself and could consider one's deeply held views this is the kind of institution i feel very grateful for but also i suppose proud at one level wow what an what an uplifting um thought and we definitely need more organizations like ncf out there um on a lighter note madhu are there any fun stories from the field that uh, you can share with us in 2003 my colleagues and i went on a an expedition a biological expedition to the remote mountains in the state of arunachal pradesh in northeastern india there we found this large monkey that the local people knew very well but it was completely unknown to the world of science so finding such an undescribed species of mammal and a large monkey at that was uh, extremely unusual and that got a lot of global uh, media attention so as it turned out around the same time independently there were two new species of monkey also discovered in south america and east africa so one fine morning i was looking at this google news alerts that just started on the feed about coverage on the discovery of the arunachal macaque and what coverage it was getting and i found a link to an article that really caught my attention following the link i i found myself staring at an, at an article about the newly discovered monkeys in the onion titled new delicious species discovered unfortunately that honor was bestowed uh, that was bestowed in the headline when to the south american monkey which the article said marked the first primate species that was discovered since the nearly inedible arunachal macaque was found in india to have been associated with a work that found mention in the onion is something i'm quite chuffed about that was a hilarious mother um i'd say discovering a new monkey species and being featured in the onion are two major accomplishments um for you indeed and uh, yeah it's it's pretty impressive um let's uh, you know let's switch gears a little um you've also been a fantastic trainer on the earth outreach trainer network and i've had the privilege of uh, seeing you in action and your trainings and workshops um where you would talk about earth engine you would talk about earth and um some of your trainings have empowered so many nonprofits and researchers in india uh, can you tell us a little bit about how you stumbled onto the world of mapping 
I, I think I always loved maps. I sat and poured over atlases uh, when I was a kid. Uh, but when I started to help these researchers, I got a glimpse of how, how what it actually meant to make a map, to draw a line on a map. And I got started trying to map a three kilometer road using this 22 yard chain, a compass and a flag. And it took me three days to draw uh, a line that was uh, three kilometers on a map. But in the context of conservation, uh, you know, it's you realize that uh, so much has been done with with so little, but now things are changing. There is there is a huge explosion in technology, and and through all of that, it's it's possible now that we uh, can access the data that can tell us about what's happening to the places we care about, and indeed to our entire planet. Uh, for instance, take the boundaries of protected areas. A lot of drama is unfolding exactly there to keep the areas that we want to protect from the areas where we want to produce is a very important priority everywhere on Earth. So we may draw lines on a map and we end up with you know, forests on one side and, and you know, farms and, and dwellings on the other. And we expect that this is all going to be well, but it's not, not that easy. So you end up with animals, coming out of forests, into farms, and uh, and so on. And people uh, end up going into forests as well. So neither ecology nor economics can actually be contained with the boundaries uh, we draw. Uh, so, but nevertheless, to be able to show, uh, show this to people rather than just explain is a very powerful way of being able to communicate. Data are important, but they can be dull. They can be boring, uninteresting, and it rarely moves people. So uh, stories are not like that. Entire civilizations are built around mythology. So the opportunity I really see in a map is to be able to bring together the rigor of data with the richness of storytelling and to produce something that's entirely visual. And we are a visual species. We rapidly learn and comprehend patterns that are visual. And this can be far more persuasive and powerful than, you know, uh, than other ways of transferring information to people. But we also can do that in ways that move them. So, of, of, and for all the things that are happening, it's you know, showing is so much more helpful than just telling. So, with all these astonishing technological advances we've made, there are really fewer and fewer excuses. I think that. Uh, not to use such a powerful tool to communication and enlighten people about the planet, but also use the opportunity to engage and enlist them to help protect it. Absolutely, Madhu. Um, to add on to what you just said, um, the unique power of maps really lies in being able to solve real world problems. Um, and maps help, as you said, make uh, information that can be used to influence decision making um, more visual and accessible to everybody. Um, Mother, speaking to that, can you tell us about a time where uh, putting information on a map helped you solve a problem? Um, and can you also tell us a little about the role mapping has uh, played in your efforts to conserve uh, habitats and wildlife in India? I think maps are important, but uh, they're they're important much more to communicate. Just you know, a map by itself doesn't solve things, but it helps us communicate the change that has taken place to the people who can change things, and that is very powerful. So, in my own work, I mean, there's a lot that has changed in the world around us. So, how have animals coped with such change? Uh, for instance, in the Western Ghats where uh, I worked. So, for instance, how have uh, distributions of animals changed over time and, and what might underlie the changes in their distribution? These are some questions that I was trying to answer in one of the projects I, I was doing across the Western Guards. I could throw a lot of numbers at you to summarize these changes or uh, as I have uh, done in this map, I uh, could show someone how the golden jackal, a species that was once very widespread and extremely common when I was a boy, has today declined both in its abundance and distribution over a large parts of this landscape. So the dark areas that were used to find them in 1980, have, have, they've begun to fade out in, in many of these areas. And you see their, 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 uh, 
they, they've become much more restricted in their, in their distribution. To be able to communicate to such large and complex patterns in ways that can be grasped by virtually anybody from those that even haven't even been to a school right up to you know a nerdy scientist or a busy administrator, that's uh, that's terribly important, and I think to uh, it's it's important uh, to bring about both understanding and to bring about change that is necessary for wildlife conservation, and and maps help us do just that. Thank you for sharing, Nanmadu. Uh, we're almost at the end of our conversation, and you've shared such inspiring stories with us today. Um, as a parting question, could you share a story or incident from your journey that uh, you think you'd always carry with you? There is there's one incident I that happened to me that I keep going back to. I was this naive young researcher working in Badra Tiger Reserve. I'd gone back there to do my work for my PhD, and I was trying to understand the kind of threat local people and their activities might pose to wildlife, such as elephants and tigers. So every day in the little village I lived, I walked past a tiny one acre plot that belonged to this man called Nagarat Shetty, an elderly farmer who had leased it as a sharecropper and he was growing rice paddy for himself and his and his wife. So the, the old couple uh, wilted in the sun working all day in the field, tending to their crop. And in the evening, Nagraj came back, bundled in a kind of a ragged blanket, carrying this feeble torch and a transistor radio, and he kind of climbed gingerly into this precarious perch on top of a tree in the corner of his field. So he'd be perched there, spending the night trying to stay awake and alert and yelling and screaming into the darkness to chase away an elephant or pig that might come for his crop. So as his crop ripened and turned golden. I thought his hardship was uh, at an end and it was nearly over. But one morning, as I was walking past his field, I was uh, utterly horrified to see that overnight an elephant had completely trashed his field and his entire crop. Not only would uh, Nagraj and his wife uh, have no food for the next year, they would also have large debts to clear. So with a lump in my throat, I, I asked him, how it happened. He said he had kind of nodded off briefly and by the time he woke up and realized there was an elephant in the field, it was already too late. And then he looked at me and said, but how can I grudge a hungry elephant his meal? When I with this tiny belly can feel so hungry, just imagine how an elephant with its enormous belly must feel. Our struggle, you know, is, is, is very much the same. We are both trying to do everything we can to keep hunger at bay. Sometimes I get lucky and sometimes, like last night, the elephant gets lucky. So even in the middle of a calamity that had brought this old man to the brink of starvation and penury, here he was with complete uncomplicated grace and generosity empathizing with the elephant's needs. So sometimes when I think back, it seems like as if seeking space for wildlife in a country of over a billion people, 1.3 billion people, is an absurd idea. Yet it's not so. What we may lack in physical space is to quite some extent made up by the vast cultural space and empathy that many, many people like Nagra Shetty have for other living beings. I'm convinced that um, this generosity of spirit and this reasonableness as much as reason or science or technology management or what have you this is absolutely essential if we have to find a way forward with conservation in india yet we cannot take such goodwill and tolerance for granted they are as much in decline today and deserve care and conservation as do our endangered wildlife that was truly, truly moving, Madhu. And uh, what a beautiful lesson of compassion and uh, empathy to uh, part on. Um, it has been um, such a pleasure speaking to you today. And we thank you so much for joining us um, for our second interview in the On the Map interview series. Um, Madhu, would you like to share any 
uh, parting words? I've already said a lot. So thank you so much, Devja, for speaking to me. And the thanks also to the incredible team at uh, Google Earth Outreach for all the wonderful work you're making possible. Thank you. Thank you, Madhu. And uh, thank you to all our viewers for joining us today. We hope you had a fun time. <laughs>